If you listen to discussions about climate change in the media and policy arenas, you'll likely have heard of the Kyoto Protocol and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's sometimes hard to sort out, though, what these groups or policy approaches are doing well and what's just not working. This lecture will provide you with a general picture of the recent history of international action on climate change. This will give you the context within which you'll learn about climate change science, scenarios, impacts, and response options. This lecture will begin by exploring the argument for tackling climate change at the international level and the unique challenges and opportunities that this presents. We'll then move on to a brief introduction to the international body that provides the most comprehensive scientific input to international policy negotiations, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Finally, we'll cover both the seminal global climate policy effort, the Kyoto Protocol, and the negotiations that have followed. Climate change pervades and impacts the very foundations of our way of life, requiring navigation through a maze of economic, scientific, societal, and governance concerns. Widely diverging interests come to play in the international arena, and the risks associated with climate change are weighed against security threats, economic fluctuations, human rights debates, and geopolitical posturing. As you can imagine, the path towards legally binding global climate change legislation has been a really bumpy one. Over the last 20 years, the international community has attempted to develop and implement mandatory greenhouse gas emissions reduction levels for developed countries, voluntary limits for developing countries, mechanisms by which funds can be transferred from rich to poor to stimulate the growth of green technology, and funds to sponsor the protection of communities against climate change impacts. These efforts have been met with mixed success, as we'll see throughout this course. The core justification for approaching our response to climate change at the global level is very simple. Greenhouse gas emissions released anywhere on the planet act the same way in the climate system. They distribute evenly and affect the global climate. They don't only affect the region from which they came. This means that a ton of greenhouse gas emissions reduced in Canada has the same impact as a ton reduced in China or Cameroon. Furthermore, our global economy is now so tightly interwoven that the repercussions of exchanging cheap, dirty technologies for clean, more expensive ones can reverberate in ways that are really difficult to predict. A related implication of the global nature of climate change is this. Many have argued that the distribution of wealth in the world is such that a small fraction of the world's population is responsible for producing the vast majority of emissions that are driving global climate change. So, the actions of a wealthy and consumptive few are creating a potentially unstoppable chain of events that may transform the livelihoods of billions of people the world over. This picture is changing, though. Rapidly industrializing countries like China, India, and Brazil are responsible for an increasingly large share of global emissions. This raises the complicated question of two goals that seem at odds with one another, providing electricity, food, and education to a growing population while limiting the effect that this development is having on the climate. Finally, international climate change policy may lead to more efficient and coordinated outcomes than efforts that take place in isolation from one another at the local level. For instance, it may be cheaper to replace extremely dirty or inefficient coal-fired power plants in developing countries rather than to pay much more, much greater amounts of money to yield small efficiency improvements in already relatively clean technologies. As we watch the negotiation of the Kyoto Protocol, however, we see that creating effective international climate change policy is far from a simple task. The complexity of the global geopolitical landscape translates into varying goals and pressures at the negotiating table, while the cost of emissions reductions may run counter to political priorities at home. The uncertainty of some aspects of climate science and our lack of understanding of what a low emissions world might look like exacerbates these issues. Added to these challenges are barriers to the implementation of policy once it's been agreed upon. Without a ruling international government, only political pressure and economic measures can be brought to bear on those who fail to meet their promised emission reduction targets. This creates strong incentive for free riding or reaping the reward of actions taken by others. A core element of international climate change policymaking is the advice provided by hundreds of scientists that comprise the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change.
The IPCC was created in 1989 to feed the latest science into the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is an ongoing environmental treaty process out of which the Kyoto Protocol grew. The United Nations Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization formed the IPCC in order to gather together the world's leading scientists on climate change and create useful and unbiased reports on the state of the art. These periodic assessment reports review the progress made on climate change science, including work on adaptation and mitigation by thousands of scientists around the world. This material is gathered together and synthesized in order to be useful during policy negotiations. In 2007, the Nobel Committee awarded the IPCC the Nobel Peace Prize in tandem with Al Gore. This brought unprecedented attention to the work of the IPCC and has pushed climate change to new heights of public awareness. In order to produce its periodic and comprehensive assessment reports, the IPCC divides its efforts into three working groups each of which addresses one major component of climate change. Working Group 1 explores the science of climate change, drawing together scientists of all stripes to assess our understanding of drivers of climate change, projected changes in the climate, and observed changes around the world. Working Group 2 assesses adaptation and impact studies, including the effects of climate change on human health, settlements, ecosystems, and many other areas. The final working group, working group three, explores the critical question of mitigation or strategies that can be used to prevent climate change from occurring or becoming more severe. Each working group draws upon the expertise of a wide range of social and natural scientists who act as authors or reviewers of the assessment reports, expert advisors and also contributors. Together, the working groups comprise a plenary panel and feed their findings to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC, which will be introduced in greater detail later. The IPCC is the largest scientific collaboration of its kind in our history. The hundreds of experts who are involved in each working group meet frequently over a five or six year period, during which they collect, assess and synthesize the scientific findings produced in thousands of publications around the world. This is actually a uniquely rigorous scientific process. The work is entirely voluntary, and the individuals who participate are selected through an extensive nomination and review process. Care is taken to ensure that author teams are comprised of individuals who represent a variety of views, nationalities, and scientific backgrounds. I, for instance, participated in working group two and working group three of the fourth assessment report, and there was no shortage of debate during those chapter drafting meetings. It was a great opportunity to share different perspectives, to evaluate what the scientific community is saying, and figure out how to synthesize it all. As the assessment reports come together, they're subjected to an intensive review and critique, the likes of which is virtually unparalleled in the scientific community. Experts who are not acting as IPCC authors play an integral role in evaluating the assessment report text, supplying new studies to evaluate or critiquing the conclusions that are drawn. The IPCC authors have to respond to each and every comment delivered by a reviewer. The IPCC is certainly not without its critics. While many of those criticisms can be easily dispelled with a closer look at this extensive review process and revision that the IPCC undergoes, Valid concerns have been raised about the value of the IPCC going into the future. Because the IPCC seeks consensus, its findings are often portrayed as conservative. This portrayal is reinforced when new findings, such as the rate of glacier melt in the Arctic, emerge shortly after the completion and publication of a major IPCC assessment process. Some people have commented that the IPCC neglects outlying views. While these views are not necessarily incorrect, the IPCC tries to gather science that's been validated and replicated by multiple experts, so it actually can't include the views of all scientists in the field. The IPCC, in its assessment process, is bound by the mandate to be policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. An appreciation of the ways in which this mandate is borne out in the work of the IPCC is critical to understanding an important set of criticisms. Because the IPCC grows out of the United Nations, its members are in fact nation states that are members of the UN. So the IPCC can't directly criticize national climate change policies or lack thereof. Instead, it has to synthesize scientific findings in such a way as to inform better policy in the future.
This leads to claims that the IPCC is abdicating its essential role as a scientific body that can in fact drive action on climate change. Ultimately though, the IPCC's role has been to provide coherent and comprehensive science on climate change. Negotiating policy is the domain of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. In 1992, the United Nations produced the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. The UNFCCC forms the backbone of global climate change policy and was created in order to manage the emissions of greenhouse gases and the resulting climate change. While the UNFCCC didn't originally contain binding greenhouse gas reduction targets, it's been protocols to the UNFCCC, like the Kyoto Protocol, that have done so. The most important function of the UNFCCC is to hold periodic meetings. These meetings are called Conferences of the Parties, or COPs, and occur approximately every 12 months. It was during COP3, for instance, in 1997, that the Kyoto Protocol was created. The Kyoto Protocol is the most significant piece of international climate change policy to grow out of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. In December of 1997, a conference of the parties to the UNFCCC was held in Kyoto, Japan. The issue on the table was the creation of a policy that would set reduction targets for all developed countries that ratified the protocol and establish mechanisms through which emissions reductions could be stimulated in developing countries. The ultimate goal was to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions at a level that would prevent dangerous levels of climate change. Key countries haven't fully supported the protocol, though. The United States, for instance, signed but didn't ratify it. The U.S. was responsible for approximately 30% of global emissions in 1990, which is the base year upon which reduction targets in the Kyoto Protocol are set. Canada appears to be one of the least successful in meeting its Kyoto obligations. Its emissions have increased by over 26% since 1990, rather than diminishing by the 6% that Canada agreed to as a ratifying party of the Kyoto Protocol. In fact, Canada became the first nation to formally withdraw from the Kyoto Protocol. The European Union, however, is on track to meet its commitments, and it's showing evidence of a significant transition towards renewable energy. The parties that ratified the Kyoto Protocol promised to meet their targets between the years of 2008 and 2012. So the next step is to negotiate a successor to the protocol. This is an understandably contentious issue, as many scientists argue the reductions agreed to in the Kyoto Protocol were too modest to effectively mitigate our influence on global climate. Furthermore, debate is sparked by the role of developing countries, especially populous ones such as India and China, in future emissions reductions. The points of contention at recent conferences of the parties reflect the broader debate swirling around global climate change policy. In particular, many developed country representatives are concerned that greenhouse gas emissions will not be effectively managed without the binding participation of key developing countries, whose emissions threaten to dwarf those in the West in the not-so-distant future. Other issues include funds to support climate change adaptation in developing countries, whether the agreement will include emissions from shipping by sea and international air travel, and the agreement upon deep and binding reduction targets for all parties to a future protocol. During this lecture, we've been introduced to a small sample of the issues related to international climate change policy. We've learned that while climate change is a global problem that may most effectively be addressed through high-level coordination, the global approach brings with it significant challenges related to complexity, uncertainty, and barriers to implementation. We briefly dipped into the role of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and also the Kyoto Protocol. In Module 2, we'll begin to explore the fundamentals of climate change science in order to better understand the core elements of the climate change debate and evaluate key climate change policies.